Welcome everyone um, and welcome back after afternoon tea. Thank, firstly, thank you to Catherine for the amazing conversation that we had about Shovel Ready Glamour graduates. Uh, next up, we have Ingrid and Catherine. Um, Ingrid drives practice change in digital transformation of humanities research and cultural heritage through the development of new technologies and national infrastructure. She's a leader and volunteer in the International Lodlum, which is linked open data for libraries, archives, and museums, and AI for LAM, which is AI for libraries, archives, and museums and in those communities. And she's also a metadata nerd and a bit of a tech head, and she's also fabulous. Uh, Catherine has, is also joining us, for, uh, who is an AI for LAM uh, committee volunteer. She has worked with Archives in Australia since 2003 and is currently the Associate Director at uh, the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology or RMIT Library. Uh, she is a PhD student in her final year at Monash University and Catherine is also the past editor of the Australian Society of Archivists Journal Archives and Manuscripts and is currently on the editorial board member for the Archives and Records Journal. So over to you lovely ladies, thanks. Thanks, Sarah. Um, lovely to be here with you today. Um, I'm coming to you today from Ngunnawal land um, and I'd like to pay my respects uh, to elders past, present and emerging. And I'd like to introduce my co-speaker, Catherine Jarvie. Thank you. Great to be here, everyone. Nice to meet you. And I, I would also like to pay my respects to their elders past, present, future and anybody here today. Great, so we're gonna to talk to you today. It's gonna to be a bit of a conversation between Catherine and I about the grassroots action that's been going on in the regional chapter for AI for and by libraries, archives and museums. We spoke at the uh, Goglia mini conference last year um, and we just thought we'd provide a bit of an update uh, to let you know what we've been up to, where we think we're heading and um, why we think you might like to be involved in some way, shape or form. So we'll just kick off. Okay, so there's a bunch of us that have come together to do some coordination. And you can see that there's quite a sprinkling there of people from Australia who've taken on coordination activities. Not everybody's active at the same time. People's lives, of course, um, uh, interrupt um, and their ability to participate is welcomed whenever it's available and um, they can take a back seat whenever they need to. So we've had people move in and out of the coordination group and uh, people come uh, to this uh, idea of AI for LAM and what we might do as a community a little bit differently, which is great. So we're gonna cover four questions today. Uh, why take a grassroots approach? Um, why does community building across group boundaries matter? Who have we heard from and what have we learned and what happens next? Um, so we're going to enter into a bit of a conversation and we really look forward to your questions or comments as we go through. So Catherine, I'm going to hand this one to you. Um, why do you think a grassroots approach was appealing? Yeah, so for me, I thought I'd talk to my motivation for joining and that was because being a grassroots group, you get a whole different cohort of people from various different uh, backgrounds, different levels of organisation, different types of people. So uh, my particular interest in AI and applying that into my workplace setting was to see what other people were doing, how they were applying AI within their personal projects or their um, technical projects at work. And because I work in a library, we haven't got any AI projects underway um, when I began uh, AI for LAM a year ago. So I was hoping to learn from my peers and really bring that back to the librarians within the university to say, hey, there's this great project that others are doing, we could do something similar, or these are the skills that we could acquire, particularly because my role is uh, Associate Director of um, Engagement. We want to engage our staff to really upskill in AI where it's necessary for their role or where their role can be built and expanded upon its, cur its current form and also recruit in to the library the skills required but we need the projects for to attract those those people and um, create those position descriptions and create opportunities for people to come into the library so that was my motivation and the reason why I thought 
joining a grassroots group like AI for Lamb would be useful to me. It hasn't necessarily panned out yet. I'm still on the hunt for, you know, as we grow and expand, I'm still looking to, for that perfect position description to create within the library or perfect project to start and kick off, but I'm sure it will happen. Yeah, that's really good. It's nice and concrete. Um, I really like uh, when we talked about this, that this was a really clear motivation and it was quite different to mine uh, because I'm not uh, in a management role. I'm managing uh, an infrastructure project at ANU, but um, I became really interested in AI because I went overseas to have a talk to some colleagues in Norway who were doing, um, who'd kicked off this whole community and it just kind of blew my mind. And um, I really could see the need to have a cross-cutting agenda because there were so many different viewpoints to sort of try and draw together and to learn from, um, to complement whatever I might be able to bring. And um, I really liked the grassroots approach because I could see that it would create a nice complement to the professional associations that many in our community belong to. Um, and it's quite hard to kind of pull all those different parts of the GLAM equation together, let alone bring them together with the research uh, community and bring them together with the technical community. So that was what really uh, appealed to me um, about the whole idea of a grassroots approach. And also, I guess, in relation to those different viewpoints, to be able to translate AI technology well was really important to me personally, probably because I've had a lot of involvement over the last, I don't know how many years, <laughs> with technology development. And it's really important um, not to take uh, technologies at face value and that critical kind of thinking seem to be a really nice niche uh, to enter into with others because you get so much use from other perspectives so yeah that's kind of why the grassroots approach and Catherine and I thought that this this is a good way of conveying to you the reasons that people have stepped up uh, to just be part of the slack channel that we've got and also to help with coordination uh, so Catherine I'll hand it back to you uh, around community building yeah, so as I said, we're, we're looking to build our AI for Lamb community and I find that the events that we do have and the conversations that we have within AI for Lamb is a good conversation starter within my library so I can share the links to our YouTube videos with them. Uh, we're really big users of Yammer within RMIT library so uh, I can share the links there and have local conversations about it it has been hard to get people to talk about AI. I think they might be wary about it. So I'd be interested to have a chat um, later in our conversations in, our, in the questions. But um, I think making people feel less scared about AI, I think there's this impression that maybe, you know, robots will take over librarians' jobs or archivists' roles. Uh, it's about, you know, talking about the opportunities, I feel, to expand uh, what we're doing and create new roles that incorporates both the human and the technology together. Uh, so I feel that has really, uh, being part of AI for Lamb has helped me have that conversation and bring that conversation into my workplace. Also, I'm studying a grassroots animal rights organisation, so I'm really interested in communities as part of my PhD research. And that research is about appraisal within communities and appraisal being how archives are stored, created and why and for how long, uh, not only by people but by technologies. And that, I think, has really led to an interest in alignment with that study with linked open data the open web and really thinking about how communities can empower themselves to be their own archivists. And again, not necessarily, get, while you're challenging the traditional archival models, you're not necessarily putting the archivists out of a job, it's partnering with archivists. So that's really aligned there. I feel that in my workplace, it's about making feel, people feel comfortable about the AI conversation and in my studies, thinking about how we can empower communities in their own archival practice without putting the archivists out in the coals, that it's a partnership. Yeah, that's, um, I think the, the comfort, we had a bit of a chat um, in prepping for this talk about 
how important feeling comfortable with technologies is. And I guess because my background is a library background, um, literacy and dexterity have always been elements of library practice where you're teaching people about new ways to find information or new types of information or new ways to create information. Um, that's definitely been an element of practice. And uh, yeah, I guess um, the community building for me was really important because I think we get the best out of each other because of our slightly different uh, approaches to things. And because I've worked in e-research, you know, um, probably for about 12 years now. And it's really altered the way that I think about um, services around collections, glam collections, um, and of course around research, because I've worked with such a different range of people. And I've really benefited. Um, there have been the occasional argument um, around, you know, uh, what AI can and should do. And, and uh, you know, it's sometimes been intimidating for me, especially when I've had a really, no, you know, toe-to-toe -to -toe conversation with one of my physics um, colleagues uh, from my time at Arnett um, because he comes at things from a very kind of particular way. And I um, I really have seen the benefit of that. And that's why I think working across the boundaries is so important. And because it's really clear in research and it's just come out in the Australian National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Strategy Roadmap that there is a, a role being seen for those who are perhaps not technical to come in and bring their different types of expertise to AI technology development and application. And it's there out there in the draft that's just been put out there in December last year that they see a specific role for social science and I would argue for humanities researchers as well um, to bring that expertise to this equation. So I guess that's really underlined for me the importance, but also because that knowledge transfer um, does need someone that's trusted to help um, facilitate a conversation or to kind of test ideas against. And um, I gave a talk to some NASLA colleagues last year because I could see a massive opportunity to bring the social skill sets to this um, use of AI technology and its developments. Yeah. Okay. So this is the matrix um, uh, that we put together for the community. And I guess it just gives you a bit of a breakdown of the areas that we're trying to work in. We're um, trying to understand how we can work with our colleagues across the Tasman. And we've had some success with that through the speaking program, which is terrific. Um, we've caught up with each other on a regular basis. It's pretty relaxed. I think it is, but um, most people sort of come and go as they can. Uh, we're really looking for more community leaders to come forward and people to pick up an initiative that they're interested in to, to, to drive that forward. Um, and we've had some really interesting, uh, I guess, moments where we've discovered that because we're on the other side of the world where a lot of the action is not happening, like a lot of the AI for Lamb action is happening in the Northern Hemisphere, that we've got real um, practical challenges around how we work with our colleagues in the rest of the world who are doing some terrific project work. So um, I guess these are, I, this is just a bit of a snapshot of what we're trying to do. So Catherine, listening and learning, what have you listened to and learned about? Yeah, so there's been so many really interesting presentations and the recordings are available on YouTube. I just picked one out um, as an example about one that really stood out and there may be so many more that we could delve into this year as well but the CSIRO hearing about their collections they've got a living archive or living collection with biological specimens and organisms that are are alive and having to be catalogued a sound library um, that has the sounds of birds so the diversity of the collection is really immense and that struck a chord with me thinking about the different databases and data sets that need to be brought together to um, really make those accessible. Uh, I can relate to that having 
a system that we have archival records in our trim and content manager system and then we've got the library alma primo system separate separated out so it's a sort of perennial problem of how to bring those together and make them more easily accessible to our users and i know um the uh, State Library of Queensland have done some really interesting things to bring their archives and library systems together. So that one in particular struck a chord with me. Okay, so um, I'm going to skip across my areas of interest because we're running short of time, but um, the, there is a very clear sentiment amongst the group of coordinators to really support um, teaching and learning. And there was some working group activity uh, last year to try and understand how to bring people into that process of learning about AI and um, perhaps playing with AI technologies. And that was um, just a bunch of people who decided to come together and work on that. But we managed to forge a bit of a link with the wider community um, who are doing uh, teaching and learning work. And I've got a link there to one of their outputs because they really went for it. Um, and it's a, it looks like a terrific handbook um, for people to go through. But I think this really was um, kind of an underlying motivation was for many people to expand their understanding and to try and lift up others as they're trying to kind of find their way into this technology. So, uh, last but not least, what are we up to next? Uh, so, Catherine, I'll throw the ball to you just quickly. Well, mine's an easy one because all the details are there on screen yeah. and people can message Ingrid. That's Ingrid's email address. We've got a website that AIforlam.org is the broader uh, global website. So we are connected into the global AI for Lamb group, but we have um, a Slack channel as well as a Google Drive that is open as well. So you all are welcome and encouraged to reach out to us and join us in our quest to talk about all things AI. Yeah, nice one. Um, so we're looking to have some more events and talks and Alexis Tyndall has told me today that she's definitely up for driving ahead with that. And I think we're gonna have a planning meeting in February. Um, uh, between uh, Australia and New Zealand, because uh, we've got some great colleagues from the National Library of New Zealand working with us. Um, we're looking for more cross-sector collaborations. We had a nice collaboration with NASLA and also with VALA last year, just to make sure that we leverage what we're doing. Um, we've been putting forward this idea of uh, a big data global challenge, and anyone's um, welcome to talk to me about that. Um, and we're looking to try and see how we can work with our peers on the other side of the world. I've just had an email from uh, Tom Kramer at Stanford and Svenan uh, from the Norwegian National Library to see how we can work with each other because they had a terrific, fantastic futures conference on the other side of the world last year um, in Paris. And of course, none of us could go. So uh, they're really open and wonderful colleagues uh, to be working with. Uh, and just to give you a bit of a flavor of what the other people on the other side of the world were thinking about when they talked about a global data set. Amy, uh, Abby Potter, sorry, from the Library of Congress took this idea uh, that I put up forward uh, to that conference to think about what a global data set might be and uh, why we might want to do something like that. And um, these are the kind of themes that came out through the consultation. But I'll put a, a pin in it there and thank you all for your attention and thank you uh, Catherine for jumping in with me at the last minute and um, yeah uh, let's hear what your questions are thanks thanks everyone thanks thank you both that was fantastic and I love that cats were in the in the word cloud there so <laughs> It was the first thing I noticed was cats was there. Um, so we've got a couple of questions for you. Uh, what are the key challenges in getting grassroots organisations up and running in this space? I think, well, from my perspective, it was about taking a risk. Um, I sat in 2020 after being to that conference. Um, and I went self-funded, went overseas to the conference um, at Stanford had an amazing time and there was one person from Australia there, um, uh, Sarah Graham from the University of Sydney. And I was so thrilled and then I thought I can't bear the idea of not having an opportunity to get with other people so I just took a punt and um, I think for me that's the biggest challenge is actually um, 
uh, creating a space for people um, to do what they think um, is a good thing to do and to help each other and uh, not to put too much structure around it and um, to support people to come and go uh, and in particular through this pandemic because people's lives have been going up and down and people have been amazing but you know I'm I'm comfortable with a, a I think a reasonably high level of uncertainty so that that's my answer what about you Catherine yeah I was going to say the same uh and that particularly this group has been quite compared to say other groups you feel the weight of obligation to be attending and to you know, do so many things for, say, professional societies or other other groups that you attend, whereas Ingrid as the leader um, and just us as a cultural, you know, the culture that we have, very supportive of each other for that, the people going in and out. So that is the difference that I feel has really made a difference to and encouraged people to come along and have a go. Yeah, definitely, because sometimes people have the best ideas. All they need is someone to be a little engine behind them. And we can all do that for everybody, for each other. Okay. Uh, next question is from Donna Benjamin, who's in the chat. Um, we have an innovation program at Red Hat around AI and ML, uh, around the use cases. I'd be interested in exploring uh, if there's any opportunities for us to collaborate with AI for Lamb uh, on some kind of experiment. Uh, how could we start this conversation? Oh, just um, there's my email address. <laughs> Just uh, contact uh, any time. Uh, that's kind of why we've jumped into these forums because we're looking either to be um, partners or to help with bro broking partnerships. Yep. Uh, and the next one is for extending into education, have you thought about reaching out to IT teachers associations? Uh, I don't, not personally, Catherine, you? We've mainly um, reached out to the glam sector, so that could yeah. be something we can put on our to-do list for this year. Yeah, or whoever asked that question, um, you can come along and drive it. Um, how can we get involved and are there any prerequisites? No, no prerequisites, just put your hand up. Uh, and uh, it's really great if you can jump in the Slack space. Uh, and if you'd like to coordinate, just get in touch. Um, I would be delighted to <laughs> announce that Sarah Germain has put her hand up um, and I've already got a little list of things that she might <laughs> like to do. <laughs> uh, and one last question. Um, have you seen AI or ML being used in any hackathons using information archives at all? And do you see that as a positive or a negative? Uh, well, not me personally i haven't seen hacking i've been to a workshop i guess i went to a workshop hosted by um, colleagues at the norwegian national library just to give tensorflow a bit of a run over with a bunch of images and that was really interesting because uh they've got computer scientists uh in their library team and um they're really working hard to unlock their collections and in particular around norwegian language because many of the um uh, i guess data sets and technologies are built heavily around english and um, they need norwegian they don't need english so um, i think there are really productive uh, reasons to get in and have a hack and to get people around a problem what about you Catherine? i've been to one in a european one through the there's an open glam forum that i found it out through there and again the time it's very northern centric so the time wasn't very australian friendly so we find that that's you know a bit of a hump to get everybody together from across the globe at the right time frame um so i was just willing to stay up and see what that was all about and in terms of any downsides well there was a call out for archival collections to be involved so uh people were willingly had collections that they wanted to be hacked um, and <clears throat> the risk assessment I guess was left with those um, archival institutions to put their hand up with I think they were typically already open and published archival content so re relatively risk-free in terms of hacking. Yeah but I guess that the question means that there is a gap here for us given your answer Catherine 
that there's a gap here for us to look at whether um, someone wants to come forward and and work with others to get a hack up uh, with cultural collections. We had a great talk earlier today um, because ACME have made their API openly available and um, have put some Jupyter notebooks out there on Colab. Uh, so I do think it's ripe for the picking. <laughs> oh, I'll help out a little bit, but there might be other people who might want to jump up <laughs> and pitch in. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you so much both for for speaking to us today. Um, at 4.20, uh, next up, we've got moving to self-managed open access publishing uh, from Jesse Lim, and that will be a fantastic talk, I'm sure. So thank you both again. Thanks, and everyone. Um, hopefully everyone joins AI for Lamb now that I have Oh, well. please do. <laughs> Join us. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks Sarah. All. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye now.